What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another fun barrel selection. We haven't, Ryan, we haven't done one of these in a while. It feels, feels like it's, when we know what we were used to doing them, like, like two weeks. I know, but we were doing like three a week, it felt like at some point. And then now if, if we haven't done one in two weeks, it's like, yeah, what the hell have we been doing with our lives? Yeah, I'm, I'm not mad about the break, but uh, I'm glad to be back at it. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. Good to see you again, buddy. Uh, so R Ryan found a nice new spot earlier in town that uh, just opened up here called Frankfurt Avenue Liquors. And I, I made him go there because there's this, uh, it's just, it's a liquor store. It's a new, I mean, they just opened up this past week, but you know, they have the, the vintage law here in Kentucky. So they have crazy amount of vintage Dusties. And they're stupid cheap. I mean, oh like, it, I mean, yeah, like, I had like a, I had a 1953 King of Kentucky and it cost $25 for a one ounce pour. Like, yeah, I had a bunch of national distiller stuff tonight. $20 sound, a pour. That like sounds just like $15 you. a pour. And then, yeah. Do you think they'll have anything, well, anything left when I'm out there later in the year? It's going to go fast. I feel like. <laughs> like as soon as the word gets out, man, that's, yeah. I mean, it, it's got to be the, it, so to put it in perspective, anybody that is like traveling through here, especially during Derby time and you're like, Oh, I'm going to find a Pappy pour somewhere. Like they've got Pappy 23 for $55. Like it's like, you, you know, you don't find that anywhere. That's kind of 30 bucks. And I was like, I want the whole bottle. Yeah. <laughs> Just keep it coming. <laughs> for sure. One glass at a time. Yeah, That's right. <laughs> and before we introduce Jordan, everybody remember Shem, uh, Uncle Shem. Yes, hey glad to have you on this one with us. Great to be here. You, you kind of uh, were cheating a little bit too. You've already started sampling some of these, haven't you? I couldn't. It, it, I was. I think I said to you guys it was becoming my my daily drinker. i um, going through the seven samples, so I was like, <laughs> we got to get we got to get this tasting happening. <laughs> Good. <Not gonna> be <laughs> left. <laughs> and then up from his savaging cook here, we got Jordan. So Jordan, welcome, buddy. Nice to meet you all. So before we kind of, well. yeah, before we kind of get too far into this, uh, you know, you had kind of talked a little about your history and background. So I want, you know, Shem and Ryan to, to kind of understand what kind of pedigree we're working with here. <laughs> ah, complete mutt, I will tell you that. Uh, no, I've, uh, I've, been, uh, I've, been, I've been making whiskey in some sense or another for about 15 years now. Uh, I started out in the wine industry here in California, uh, was moderately successful with it. Uh, uh, got up to assistant winemaker at a couple of different properties. Uh, the thing I didn't love was the very, uh, you know, the, the variability of it, uh, relying on what nature gave you and trying to make the best uh, that you could out of that. So, uh, you know, chemistry background uh, by by education before any of this, and uh, I really love the repeatability of things you could distill, you know? So I uh, started working with a small distillery in Petaluma, California called uh, Stillwater Spirits. Uh, ended up taking over for uh, the, the distiller there and ran for about three years. In that time, I started teaching classes for the American Distilling Institute. Uh, Bill Owens at the time was, uh, well, he still is the president emeritus. His son, Eric, has greatly uh, taken over much of the duties of, of running that operation. and. Um, you know, some wonderful side organizations, the ACSA, uh, ACSA has split off of that, and some other things. I, I love the community nowadays. Uh, back then, there wasn't a whole lot of uh, people in the what the hell is happening beyond throwing it in a pot, it ferments, we put it in a still, and what comes out is whiskey, uh, which was uh, strangely like a whole lot of people's understanding of it. So with a chemistry background, I was, uh, I was able to bring a little bit of that to it. We did a lot of like week-long immersion classes, and I had a pretty good alumni of people who passed through those. Um, I mean, some some strange ones, uh, like uh, Wes Henderson came and took my class before he started Angels, and to which I was like, uh, why don't you just go learn from Dad, you know? <laughs> he was like, Dad sent me here. What are you guys are doing these days? It's like, okay, well, I'll do my best. Um, anyway, a uh, few people like that, you know, a Stephen Gould with uh, – uh, Oh my God, I should have should have came up with the name of his distillery before I started that because he's done very well. Anyway, I'm not going to uh, name drop a bunch of people who I've uh, had the pleasure of, of maybe giving a couple of tidbits of information to, but um, I taught that class for many years. In the process of that, I uh, met a few people who were opening up Breckenridge Distillery up in Breckenridge, Colorado uh, back in 2008, and uh, 
they enticed me to move up there 10,000 feet on top of a mountain and make whiskey because, you know, that's that's completely practical. Um, <laughs> so we would ship absolutely everything up there. And when it wasn't snowing too hard to get anything in or out, you know, we uh, we would ship whiskey back down the mountain. So uh, beautiful facility up there if you've never been. Uh, made whiskey there for uh, a little over uh, nine years, almost 10 years before uh, my through that, during that time, you know, after about five years, the distillery was running itself. Uh, I have five fantastic assistant distillers up there who pretty much do everything. If you don't, after five years, you've done something terribly wrong, you should reevaluate your skills. Uh, and sitting in your office trying not to get drunk before noon uh, became a pretty boring thing to do with each day. I started consulting. Uh, through that process, uh, I started making, um, uh, well, Heaven's Door. Uh, for Bob Dylan with uh, the Spirits Group out of Chicago. Uh, same guys who, strangely enough, all ties back around to the Angels Envy Project, uh, Mark Bouchal and, and, and Wes Henderson out there. Uh, and um, have an Irish whiskey out in uh, Waterford called Matter Jack Irish Whiskey. Um, again, through people met through through all the, uh, all the educational courses through the ADI. Uh, started a little gin project out in New York, which uh, is, is since it's still being made, but it's gotten much smaller called Queen's Courage. And um, anyway, I've consulted for uh, a number of people around the country. Process of that, I met uh, Dave Finney back here in California as life tends to do to you. Everything comes back around full circle. Uh, exactly, you know, 30 minutes away from where I started down in Napa making wine. We're here in Vallejo, which is just, just, north of uh, Napa on your way to the Bay Area. We're here beautifully sandwiched between the mouth of the Napa River, which is the Mare Island Strait, and San Pablo Bay on a retired naval base. And, uh, you know, Dave Finney was always somebody, when you were a young winemaker back in 2005, you know, to 2010, which was my little window of, of wanting to really be a winemaker, uh, Dave Finney was like the, the story. He, he had started his wines in his garage they were, they were gorgeous. He started with the Prisoner. You uh, run into that. You know, it's got a Goya carving on the label. Uh, a beautiful, very non-traditional at the time blend when everybody was selling wines from varietally. You know, it had to say Cabernet Sauvignon, Sinfandel, or Merlot on the label uh, because that's how consumers bought their wine. He bucked that and said, you know what? You can make much better wines blending stuff together and not committing yourself to one variety. And, and, and he just did it. And he put red wine on the label, which is, you know, all the – uh, alcohol and tobacco tax and trade bureau will allow you to put uh, because if you didn't have 75% of something in it, you know, what are you doing? You, you, you don't know what you do. I love, I love how we get these arbitrary rules all the time. Uh, but anyway, the, uh, he was, he was very innovative with that. People, people embraced it. They loved his wines. They loved the, uh, you know, iconic label designs he did. These, these just edgy, uh, things that didn't have any information on them. They were nothing like European counterparts. It was just uh, some some wild image and maybe a little bit of text uh, that maybe described it or maybe didn't. Maybe just something to make you think. So when I got the opportunity to come back and work with him on this beautiful historic building that we're standing in right now, built in 1892 uh, at great expense. It was uh, took about four years to refurbish. Um, we put in a 24-inch uh, Vendome Copper and uh, Brassworks uh, continuous column with a, a connected 500-gallon doubler. Uh, for those of you, you know, uh, uh, still still geeks out there who are, who are doing the math right now, no, it didn't need a 500-gallon doubler, but it sure looks impressive. <laughs> <laughs> you could have passed that by us. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> put him the original design, and he's like, well, that's not so impressive. Can we make it bigger? Well, that's going to be expensive. Uh, the doubler actually costs more than the column. So, you know, that makes sense. Uh, but no, it's a gorgeous system. It's got uh, incredible capacity. Everything everything works so well. The aging conditions down here, sandwiched between two rivers, gives me uh, more humidity than you'd expect. Uh, you know, there's not a lot of, uh, at least California distilleries, there's a lot of California distilleries uh, these days, a little over 2,000 small distilleries operating, and a few very big ones. Uh, the very big ones are a little more inland. And the problem you get inland in California is humidity drops off precipitously as you get uh, further inland. So I've, I'm able to maintain, uh, you know, nothing like Tennessee or Kentucky, but 
but 60 to 75% relative humidity out here, which really helps with evaporative loss, helps with the right kind of aging conditions for the barrels. So we're producing uh, about 2,000 barrels a year. Uh, pretty, pretty good by our standards, 20,000 gallons of fermentation capacity, operating four days a week, uh, four or 5,000 gallon fermenters, uh, pushing those through a, a 24 inch column, uh, producing in a good week about 50 barrels and uh, operating on about uh, 10 months. You know, you can do the math, about 2,000. And that's, that's on a single shift. We've got the capacity to up this thing to, to five or 6,000, but basically the same, same setup that Maker's Mark started with way back in the day. And that's where we saw ourselves going to be a bit arrogant about it, right? Hey, that's, that is quite Love the it. intro, Joe Jordan. <laughs> yeah, you're like the dream guest. You just like <laughs> ask you a question, you run with it. I love it. <laughs> Makes it easy I'm, on us, that's for sure. But I'm, I'm a huge fan of Prisoner and Saldo is one of my favorite. We were drinking that two nights ago, or last night, actually. Uh, huge fan of Saldo. Uh, and I love the package. It just says Saldo, and that's it. <laughs> you know. Yeah. And it looks like it, it was on a label maker, you know, back in the day or something. Absolutely. Well, you'll, you'll love the new, uh, the new whiskey we just made for uh, Scotty Pippen. We just launched that two days ago. It's called Digits. And, uh, you know, Dave doesn't normally recycle ideas, but when it comes back around to it, you'll, you'll, you'll notice a similarity to the, uh, the so Jordan and Pippen re reunite, huh? He won't stop. <laughs> <laughs> That's my dream right there. Yeah. That's, I was telling Jordan here before the uh, before we started here that you know they've been blowing up headlines today because Scottie Pippen's new bourbon's just been all over the, the Google news feeds right in here. So congratulations on on having that and having a bigger name for Savage and Cook that's starting to hit some headlines. So congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was really fun working with Scotty. He's a he's an incredibly down to earth guy. He's so interested in whiskey. Uh, you know, I've I've done a few things for a few different, uh, not to be named, celebrities uh, who are looking at, at whiskey projects and whatnot. Uh, so many of them, while still you know, very passionate about what they're doing, uh, we're kind of just trying to put their name on something. That is not Scotty's vision here. He literally came down here and bottled up about, uh, you know, about 500 cases in a day with us. And he did not leave the station. He was labeling and putting tamper stamps on. We, we, we do most of... Uh, what we do here by hand, we like to make sure that labels are, you know, applied properly and, and it, it gets touched at each point along the process. So Scotty held his own on the bottling line and he was pretty much the only one who could get the uh, bottles off the top of a nine stack rack. <laughs> that would make sense. Seven, three wingspan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so before we, uh, I guess, kind of, so we've got, what we've got, seven barrel samples in front of us. So yeah, kind of talk, to, yeah, kind of talk to me like how this is working because we I see we've got four different straight bourbons, uh, three different cash finishes, got a Cabernet, a Zinfandel, and a Grenache. So kind of explain like what we're doing here. Yeah, so um, just a, the Cabernet, Zinfandel, and Grenache finishes. So when I got out here, uh, you know, back down off the mountain, came back to California, and started making some uh, uh, some whiskey with Dave Finney here. I didn't want to, yeah, you know, Breckenridge fairly traditional bourbon whiskey style. I came back down, we were working with a lot of the same stock, you know, uh, stuff out of George Dickel in Tennessee, stuff out of MGPI. You know, we hadn't made anything yet, so we're, 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 we're buying uh, uh, the whiskey that we all know, every, you know a lot of people use to start out with. Uh, we're making our 2,000 barrels a year, and we're, we're planning to make a hard transition to that when all that's aged up, which is gonna be about two more years. We're, we're two years into, into our own stock uh, now, but it's gonna be that long. Anyway, point being, uh, I had to figure out how to make this Dave Finney's whiskey. And I took the great varieties that he was most known for working with. You know, Zinfandel arguably is most famous. That was the base of the prisoner. Uh, uh, very big part of like the Saldo, or Sam. And uh, uh, anyway, he was always been, he's always been a Zinfandel centric winemaker. Uh, after mo selling the uh, or, you know, selling the the prisoner to the group that he did, he started uh, Orange Swift, which is where Saldo and uh, Papillon and um, uh, Mercury Head and El Coco and all these all these great ones. 
He uh, started to gravitate more towards Cabernet. A lot of his uh, uh, French projects, which his second home is over in uh, Maury, France, where he does a Grenache-based wine. So I only give you this backstory and all this exposition to kind of uh, explain uh, where I was going with it. I wanted to make them whiskeys that were that had an element of Dave Finney to them. And these are, these are the three varietals that we decided most uh, defined Dave Finney's winemaking style. Uh, tricky, extractions. tricky extractions are not like doing a port finish or a Fedri Menez finish or, you know, a Madeira finish or uh, some, some sweet dessert wine. These are table wines that have very little residual sugar relative. They, they're, uh, the, the barrels still have a lot of tannin and, you know, it's French oak. You got it. It's a reason we don't age a lot of whiskeys and French oak. So, uh, anyway, that's what we have here. They're aged from 45 to 60 days, uh, finished in Cabernet Zinfandel Grenache barrels. Our three core products here at Savage and Cook uh, are rye whiskey, which is our flagship, finishes in the Grenache barrels. Um, our middle tier, which is a, a corn based whiskey, it's 95% corn. It's a very, uh, it's, it, it sees no new oak. I finished that in the Zinfandel barrels and our bourbon whiskey, uh, which is our, uh, our, our most popular, I'd say the rye is our flagship. We want it to be, I want people to drink my rye. Uh, the, uh, the bourbon um, sees the Cabernet Sauvignon barrels. So, okay. And that, that's on the standard lineup for, for our um, uh, lineup here. Are they all bourbons or are they kind of what you just described in, in terms of the, uh, the base whiskey that's been finished? So what you have in front of you is all bourbon. Yeah, yeah. No, we've, uh, so, you know, this this is from the experimental range of, uh, like I said, the Grenache made the cut for the rye, the Zin for the whiskey, and the Cab for the bourbon. But these, all three of these are cask strength bourbon at about 115 proof, uh, 115 to 117. I didn't bother, you know, uh, gauging each one with a, <laughs> with a hydrometer because we'll, we'll, we'll do that when we do our final blend. But uh, yeah. Cabernet, Zadil, Grenache. Well, cool. so is the idea that we um, we start off with the straight bourbons and then we try the finishes and see like which single barrel we want to finish? Like, is that the process here, or what's the what's the idea? Well, no. So those three, we we hold those, we age those for like I said, forty five to sixty days. And again, it's just a process of of monitoring it. We start. I start getting worried about it at forty five. Uh, have rarely gone past 60 days. So that's just what I say on those. Uh, the other four samples we sent you gentlemen are actually from some of the oldest whiskey we have uh, on site that we haven't already bottled. We had, a, we had a 14 and a 17 year that we bottled as a, as a small project just recently. But these are uh, a little over six years. It's our uh, uh, 2015 stock. We sent you four single barrels of it. Mm -hmm. And this is just a... Uh, Straight bourbon whiskey, 21% unmalted rye adjunct, 4% uh, malted barley, 75% uh, corn, yellow corn number two. And uh, these have been, they spent their first year and a half in uh, Indiana, made under the tutelage of Perry Ford there, the beautiful uh, MGPI distillery. And then they came here and spent the, their next five years. Since we opened up some of the first stock we bought, we parked it in our warehouse, we just wanted to kind of get a feel for what the, you know, to borrow a winemaker's term, the terroir of Mare Island was. So we've aged it all up here, and I have tasted its uh, contemporaries that came from the same 2015 stock still being held over there at MGPI, and it is completely different. Oh, interesting. The sense of place, really, it, it really does matter, uh, the conditions under which it's aged. So. Gotcha. Cool. All right. So just, just to make sure. So we're choosing a straight bourbon then. That's that's the goal here. That's what I was told in the notes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't really know. Yeah. So that's why I was just kind of like, we'll, we'll figure it out when we start. I mean, if, if, if we fall in love with uh, one of the four bases and then also fall in love with one of the finishes, would marrying one of those finishes with one of the bases be an option? That sounds like our best option. I okay. like it already. Yeah. Perfect. Right on. I have a feeling I'm gonna like Zinfandel, but <laughs> just because I'm a Zin fan. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, we'll get there. We do different programs right now. We uh, in the beginning we were only we we try to come up with a unique barrel select program. You know, uh, none of our whiskey was made here, so uh, it seemed kind of 
uh, you know, a little boring to say, oh, come pick a single barrel. Um, so we started offering the three finishes that we did in each expression, the bourbon, the whiskey, the rye, and let people put together their own percentages. In our own house blend, we only use uh, 18% of the Cabernet finished in our bourbon. So 100% pretty intense. But that's what you have in front of you. Right on. All right. Well, I just poured all what the bourbons. Doing, okay. I just poured all the bourbons. So I got all, I had four glasses. I poured all four of the bourbons. I think it okay. might be better if we, we choose the bourbon first and then we choose the, we the finish. finish. Okay. Yeah. So that seems so like a plan. Two, one, two, four? Uh, yeah, we got two, yeah. one, two, four, two, one, two, five, two, one, two, six, two, one, two, seven. Right. Nice and, and easy. Then, and then on the finishes, I went alphabetical. That sounds like a smart move. Jim, you're one. always thinking, man. Okay. Yeah, I know. I was like, I'll, I'll, I've only brought four glasses up here, so I got to choose the bourbon, dump them, and then, uh, <laughs> and then we'll go see what's well, going I on. I packed seven because I didn't know what I was like. What are we doing? Smart move. Yeah, I didn't know what we were doing either. But hey, we, we figured it out. We're, we're going. Sorry about like that. This, this is pretty cool. cool. Up still. I'm excited about this. Yeah, me too. This is uh, so this once we get down this path. I mean, this is a, a barrel selection that we've never kind of done before. So being able to to choose. Cool. The, well, I should say we did the broken barrel one, but this is much different. This is a little bit more, uh, kind of more traditional wines, which is kind yes. of interesting. Yes, you know. So you get a case of wine too with the purchase of a barrel. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you no, know, we haven't gotten quite that desperate yet. <laughs> <That's funny. laughs> We're still down the whiskey because the whiskey's good. Yeah. So two one two four again. These are all off the same rack, stored in the same area of the distillery uh, or of the, the, the you know the rick house that we have here on the island um, we do open the shutters in the summer let the let the summer in in the winter we close it up try to hold a little bit of heat in there although it's california so it never yeah never really too bad what I remember um, when I was in andrew napa, was oh go, oh, go ahead no i was just say i remember when i went to napa it was like in july it was like 90 during the day, but then it's like 45 at night. It was yeah. like huge swings. It was wild. Yeah. That's what we get here. We get some pretty good uh, variations. Now, we're a little moderated by our proximity to these two bodies of water. We're on an island, uh, literally, between two big bodies of water. So we get, we get, we keep it a little bit moderate here. Does that bay fog kind of hang, hang over you until about 10 in the morning? No, we don't get that here, which is nice. And, oh gosh, I keep forgetting everything's backwards over here. Andrew, Andrew. <laughs> Northern California representative for our brand uh, here, and he's uh, he's set this up for us. So he's just uh, hanging around drinking with us. So Probably just Dave, making sure we, did, uh... making sure we buy something. <laughs> <laughs> so was Dave always into whiskey, or did he just? Wine making led into whiskey. Is how how did that kind of transition happen? Yeah, you know, uh, he he he's always been uh, uh, primarily a wine drinker. Uh, he did start, to, you know, just like anything else. You start your, your your tastes evolve. You start drinking new things as you get a little older. As things uh, uh, your palate evolves, you're introduced to new things. Uh, you know, he grew up around here, so wine was the was the natural start. But um, when he, after doing you know, eighteen wines between the the prisoner and the Orange Swift catalog and his uh, his wines through D sixty six over there in France, uh, he just wanted to try something new. He did uh, very quickly identify that he knew uh, absolutely nothing about making whiskey, though. And so one thing Dave is great about is surrounding himself uh, with the right people. And uh, he, uh, he has, uh, you know, a team of incredible winemakers who make uh, his wines aside from him. You know, you don't, you don't make uh, 22 wines by yourself. Nobody's, <laughs> nobody's in that capacity. He's, uh, he can't be everywhere at once. So, is there any, when you, uh, you're blending wines versus blending whiskeys, is there, you know, a different, mindset or different like process like uh what keep going until like it tastes me, good well just me dabbling in blending you know it's like all right i know that this bourbon or this bourbon or whiskey is going to be a good base because it's not 
too offensive. There's nothing spot, you know, too bold about it, but it's going to be a good base. And then you slowly add in, you know, little flavors that you want from other distillates or whatnot. Um, I didn't know if that was, I, I'm just curious about the blending process and wine. I yeah. No, I mean, uh, and your process in blending whiskey. I always like learning from people who blend. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we, uh, you know, we, we, each blend is unique to itself. Uh, luckily, we, we were able to acquire enough stock early on that we don't have to compromise on, uh, you know, this is what we have to do because this is what we have that's aged up. We bought a, a good amount of stock and uh, I get to hand pick each blend. And at about 30 barrels per blend in the, uh, in, the, in the blending tank, I can open 60, 70 barrels and pick 30 that I think work with our house style now. That doesn't mean the other 30 didn't work. It just means they didn't, they didn't fit right in with everything. It's a, it's a process of finding a majority of well-balanced barrels, things that have taken on, uh, you know, barrel extract, oxidative qualities, uh, those secondary qualities of, of uh, esterification that have happened by, uh, you know, gaining aromatic complexity through slow oxidation in the, in the barrel. Um, and, you know, there, there, there's a lot of, <laughs> every every barrel is, is its own unique thing. They they all fit in categories, and you have to kind of uh, slot them into some broad categories. I have five myself that I try to adhere to, although some can't be pigeonholed into that, and you have to sit them aside, call them outliers, and consider them for some kind of single barrel project. But uh, each each blend is is carefully selected by just picking the right barrels that go together and make and make the style you've been trying to make. I saw Lucas's question there too. Um, you know, a, a, a barrel aged out here uh, in these particular conditions in Northern California, which Northern California has a whole lot of different uh, uh, climates to, to, to speak of around here. We happen to be very maritime, close proximity uh, to the bay and a river on the other side. Um, very moderated here. I would say something that uh, would taste like... Um, uh, I'd say a six-year-old MGPI finished, uh, uh, aged entirely in Lawrenceburg, Indiana, uh, would be more akin to something that's four to five years old here. It slows down the aging process a little bit. Uh, we get a little less evaporative loss. Uh, I got which, those big ass brick or cement warehouses too, right? So I mean, it's, they stay very, they stay pretty yeah. cool, um, but they do warm up too. I mean, it was 99 today in the in the barrel house, so we are not. Uh, uh, you know, doing any kind of soft Scottish aging here on our bourbon or anything like that. Um, it just doesn't s sustain, as uh, uh, Cecil was saying, it, it drops down uh, considerably in the evenings. It doesn't sustain that through the day, like you will with an extremely humid uh, environment like Tennessee or Indiana or Kentucky. Very cool. So far, I've been drinking these. It's got some spice on them. What do you yeah, think? Spice uh, on them. Uh, so I'm, I mean, I'm not going to, I'm not going to burden you with my opinion yet. Yeah. We, we don't need, we don't need that much influence. We, <laughs> we got your 15 minute intro earlier. We know you, we know you know what you're talking about. So <laughs> you, anything you say is going to sway our votes. Oh yeah. Yeah. With a pedigree like that, we're going to, we feel, I feel, uh, not worthy already. <laughs> uh oh, come now. Every, you trust your own palate. It's my palate, if anything, is just been beaten up so much. I uh, I like a particular style. Yeah. All of these are going to be delicious, gentlemen. There is no bad pick in the bunch. I will say so, that. So, Jordan, just to just to follow up on on the the aging question we were talking about, were, were you saying that uh, the barrels, had they stayed in Indiana, would be more like four to five year stuff aged where you are? or that where you are, it slows the aging process? Uh, what I meant by it is I, our stuff at six years tastes a little more like four years in Indiana. So it slows okay. the whole extract process down. However, that's not a really apples to apples comparison either because uh, when you slow that process down, that process of, of deep extract where you get that respiration in the barrel through big heat exchange, you know, heats up in the summer, pushes out into the capillaries of the barrel, and then it cools down and pulls back and all this convective effect. Um, we do get more esterification, which arguably makes for more aromatic complexity, less extract, less vanilla, cinnamon, smoke, more 
fairly hard to uh, define flowery adjectives for uh, how something smells. Okay. Ryan can help you out there. Ryan's full of <laughs> flowery adjectives. <laughs> yep. So, yeah, you know, like I said, all four of these are delicious, gentlemen. I mean, well, one of them's not. Choose carefully. One of these is poison. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a bitch. I already tried all four of them. <laughs> we thought we'd make it interesting. Yeah. It's a, it's a delayed reaction, though, right? So, like, as soon as we, soon as we cut minutes. the live, yeah, as soon as we hit the live broadcast, as soon as we cut it, then that's, when, that's when we start grabbing our hearts. <laughs> yeah, there's like a, on the front end of these, there's like a crispy kind of fruitiness of it, but then it just opens up to this, like, Big robust baking spice, a lot of baking spices. Um, yeah, it's like yeah. I think they would be like perfect, like in a finished in a barrel too. Like because they're they are so bold and spicy. I think probably with the the wine finish, or like it's like a match made in heaven. Or might take might take it down a little bit, right? Yeah, add some of that. Um stewed kind of darker fruit berry notes on on those finishes mm -hmm. which is lovely yeah which all complements the uh you know the, the little the residual wine that's left in the wine barrels and uh and french oak you know the the, the little bits of uh what's what's left to extract so why do you get why do you get nervous uh at 45 days when it's sitting in a when it's sitting in a wine barrel Especially with the Cabernet and the Zinfandel barrels, which are right here from uh, a project uh, just about two hours north, or about two hours, about, I'm sorry, about 20 minutes north of me uh, here in Rutherford, uh, up the Napa Valley. Uh, our spring is two hours north. Um, you know, it's, again, well, uh, uh, the fruit hangs for so long, gets a lot of fruit tannin, a lot of intensity of the uh, tannin structure that's in the skins of the grapes. We put that into new French oak barrels. 50% uh, of the barrels are, are uh, replaced every other vintage. So they're very gently used wine barrels. They're not like the, you know, 20, 30, 40 year old, uh, vin you know, barrels we get from say a port producer who just retired them after the things were about to fall apart. We have to bring them up here and recoup them before we can even fill them full of whiskey. Uh, so anyway, um, they're not charred. They're just toasted as winemakers uh, do. That charring process deactivates uh, about 75% of the tannin that's accessible in the, in the uh, you know, hemicellulose and, and cellulose layers of the, of, the, of the barrel. So those are uh, the layers I was thinking about too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The first layers that the liquid comes in contact with. Yeah, um, I was like, it was like, yeah, you, you understand you're, you're talking up here and we're so, we're so down here. <laughs> I'm nodding my head. Like, uh-huh. I understand. Uh -huh. You got it. So uh, anyway, those, those first layers, we have to, we have to break down those tannins or, you know, you guys know what tannin is. You probably. Oh yeah. Yeah. And he loves them. Anybody who's had a big, Cab, uh, yeah, Napa cab that they drank too young. It's out of balance. It makes the whole dries out the back of the tongue, and you can do the same with your whiskey. Yeah. Doesn't play well, by the way. High alcohol tannin. They don't like each other. How frequently do you have to monitor it uh, during that forty-five to sixty-day process? Well, uh, depending on our assessment at forty-five days, uh, we start with the cab. Well, I'll taste it again at 50 and from there, probably daily up until we hit 65 and we rarely hit 65 yeah. and yeah, heavy tannins are a problem. They, uh, uh, we've got, like I just said, the, the French oak barrels that are used for the winemaking process have not been charged. So the tannins are not denatured. They're there. We haven't extracted them all. You know, wine's a fairly mild solvent, even at 17, 18%, some of these big Cabernets that are made here in Napa. When we put it in at sixty percent ABV or one hundred and twenty proof, that stuff—it's a—it's a smaller molecule. It pushes out into the capillaries. It extracts a whole lot. We have to be really careful with it. Right on. So, yeah, Ryan, I, I know like, you're, you're uh, usually a little—you're always a little slow for tasting these. Have you gone through all four of them yet? I've been through the three, or. Yeah, 24, 25, 26. There is like a, like a, some of them have like a hibiscus note. Like I only, it reminds me of a popsicle. I had at Steel City Pops the other day. Mm. It's like a hibiscus popsicle. 
And then some of them have like, but a lot of them have, they move into like a florally fruity into honey and then, then, the, then just elevated spice towards the end. But uh, I definitely get like a hibiscus on some and lavender and some like on the front ends, but I don't know. Maybe that's just me. No, absolutely. man. If we, if we were tasting some like, uh, you know, Bardstown, Kentucky whiskeys, I might, uh, I might, I might start thinking you're uh, getting a little flowery with that shit. But we're, uh, we're, we're literally, we're, you know, we're tasting some stuff that was aged out here. And that's why I said this moderated climate allows greater complexity of the aromatic qualities because it allows longer esterification. It allows. Uh, yeah, it has some like gin botanical flavors on the front end almost um, that kind of open up in that big spice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those primary flavors of orange and, you know, burnt orange, caramel, vanilla. Yeah. Cinnamon, the things you expect in bourbon are there, but they're they're underneath layers of, of a little more uh, complex aromatic qualities. They come through in the finish too, because you know that's that's how the old factory system works. For sure. Heck yeah, I like them. Well, Ryan, you keep you keep going. I'm I think I'm down to my final two because we've got still got three more to go through here. Yeah, and and just just for the record, I've been I've been down to my final two for a couple of weeks, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think like all you've, right. been, you've been prepping for this one, man. I'm trying to wrap my head around. All right, what's the one I like as is, and what's the one I want to finish <laughs> in something? Well, that's what I'm I'm kind of going back and forth between two of them on it right now. Right, here's a good question from from Ben for you there, Jordan. Is anybody ever taken a, a wine barrel and then charred it to finish a whiskey? Not me, and uh, as far as uh, my network of colleagues, I have not heard of anyone specifically doing that. I think if uh, in the process of doing that, you know, disassembling at least the heads of a wine barrel, when we when we fill wine barrels, we like to get them fresh dumped. Uh, they uh, wine is a, a is a living beverage. Uh, when even after. Even if, even in barrel fermentation, uh, which is not the you know common thing, but even after uh, dumping those, there's they, they start to get attacked by bacteria, opportunistic uh, uh, fungus, and, and and other things pretty quickly. So you, you you like to fill them while they're still fresh. Plus, that's when the wine that was left in the barrel is the freshest in the capillaries of the barrel, not you know specifically sitting in the barrel. Uh, taking that apart and charring it, you're going to burn out all those qualities of the wine that were there. Probably caramelize residual sugars in that wine, which are not going to be good. It's going to be kind of like burnt wine, kind of a, a shitty brandy kind of smell to it. Don't like shitty brandy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not an expert on it. I've not done it. I'm not saying it can't be done. Um, it wouldn't be my first choice for, for uh, a, a, an aging vessel. We're going to put that on the tasting notes for this one to see if people catch it. Shitty brandy. Shitty brandy mixed with a little bit of stewed apples. I want some glasses like Shim has. Those are gangster. Shit. I like those. <laughs> pretty sweet, yeah. It's like a hybrid between a wine glass and a computer. And carrot on the end of a stem. Yeah. It's pretty awesome. You're on mute, Shim. Uh, My dogs were going crazy. It, uh, Blake was uh, was doing a, a tasting with D a couple months back, and I pinged him. I'm like, you got to tell me where those glasses are, and where you got them that flare out. And so he gave me the the like picture of the SKU number. It looks like they're they're not making them in the states anymore. It's um, what's that brand? Uh, Shot Zweisel or however you pronounce that. Zweisel. Uh, but I, I found them at uh, Amazon UK for like. 40 bucks and they shipped them here right on yeah that's, that's what to say we can't get those with our logo on them can we damn it <laughs> damn it <laughs> all right i got my two is everybody two. Up way down to 27 i i think yeah i think uh yep. what do you think we should do should we choose our favorite of uh, favorite favorite one or we're gonna end up with like everybody chooses one that we're gonna be kind of fucked should we choose our top two and then, two, and then hopefully uh, there's and hopefully there's, there's one, one that that kind of like is yeah. is more than the rest okay yeah yeah all right uh let's go ahead i'll take uh i'll start the vote uh if two one two four is in your top two raise your hand you got a got a one vote there uh two one two five 
<laughs> got a one vote there. All right. <laughs> this is not going to be good. Two and two six. Hey, that's a. Yeah. I, I think that's pretty definitive right there. Yeah, I think so yeah. too. And two and two seven. <laughs> All right. So two and two six is by far the winner. I actually, not even, no joke. I had that one circled as my favorite, right? So, yeah. so two one two six was my favorite. Two one two four is like maybe it'd be better to age in wine. <laughs> <laughs> my little check mark system. <laughs> there we go. Four that, check marks. We were we were oddly all on the same page there. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, you know, he's a clear winner. Uh, I think it's. Uh, I'm gonna have to. If I'm gonna have to come up with a flowery adjective like Cecil down here. <laughs> I, I was getting some of that same kind of um, honey and and but I was also getting like some uh, like dates and graham crackery type uh, on the on the on the finish as well. Yeah. well. See, and I thought it had you know we were talking about spice earlier. I thought it had just enough spice that it will age in a barrel, you know, in a wine barrel pretty well and still be able to shine through, and it won't be just like over overtaken by a, a wine presence right agreed i think it's uh i think it's a clear uh winner of the of the four here which you know is evinced by all of us selecting it but uh no it's got the most aromatic complexity and i also think uh it's got the most potential for taking up with what i already think i would put it in but i'm not gonna yeah <laughs> well yeah. guys I, i'm not gonna say much but let's just go ahead and give ourselves a little pat on the shoulder there we were uh <laughs> yeah this one's good it's got we're, some not nice only we're in there. unison but we we go ahead and we we all we just picked the same one as jordan we all did so <laughs> got citrus honey tea like a black tea kind of note too yeah. i feel like you guys have been at this for a while we've done a few like you said we try not to get drunk before noon as well hey no i'm kidding <laughs> <laughs> Except Ryan did today. Well, no, I'm just kidding. That was from three thirty to five. Happy hour. Yeah, it's happy hour. hour. Yeah. Did you get one of those uh, frozen? Oh yeah. Uh, old, old fashions. fashions that she's insane, man, right? It was killer. It so was, the anyway, oh, I saw that on your Instagram. Yeah, everybody's just now catching on. There's this this is new uh, liquor store slash bar that just opened up right near Ryan and I. And they've got insane prices on dusty pours. Like I had a 1953 King of Kentucky for $25. But they also do frozen cocktails and they have basically an old fashioned slushy. And it tastes, and I mean, it was so good. It, it tastes just like an old fashioned. Yeah, it's not overly sweet. It had like, it was, it was, cause sometimes you get those, you're like, gosh, it's probably going to be a sugar fest. But it was like a really good old fashioned frozen. I don't know. It was and they and they still put a Luxardo in it. They did. They put Luxardo. That's awesome. The You'll have and to add that making, to your uh, uh, your Yelp. I do need to add it to my Yelp list. No, yeah. you're right. You're right. No, don't do it. <laughs> Ryan, we were, Ryan and I were talking about this earlier. He was like, he was oh, like, I true, love this yeah. place, but we can't talk about it because can't he, ruin it. As soon as people it's find like, I out about it, I want to tell people it, about it, but I don't. You know. Mm. And it's perfect. They got like. It's like not stuffy in there. They have couches and lounge chairs that like. Oh man! But like, they had TVs with like the baseball game. It just was like the perfect blend of like a bourbon bar, but like chill. I don't know. It's pretty cool. Sorry, back to Savage and Cook. Back. No, no, I've got to additionally plug my own thing here by saying we uh, my very first in my 15 years of uh, of making booze in every iteration I could uh, talk anybody into paying for. I made my first RTD. And it is Ooh. called uh, Homeschool, based on, on the. I have no idea. I don't have kids. But, how about uh, the how about the pandemic? Just blame it on the pandemic because we're all homeschooling our kids. We're all homeschooling our kids. <laughs> I'm married to my damn work, but uh, it's uh, yeah, no, the the homeschool. I did a old fashioned, a blood orange old fashioned. Uh, I could not find a, a sweet vermouth that I liked, so I brought wine down from up valley. Uh, aromatized it myself in my own 13 uh, botanical blend uh, and uh, made my own uh, orange bitters, added the appropriate amount of sugar that I thought was uh, the fit the blend. And oh, there it is. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, packaged it up. And it was, uh, just in time. Like, like just perfect timing there. Uh, homeschool uh, Orange Manhattan. 
in little bottle. Watch out for these little freaking hand grenades. They are 70 uh, proof, so and they're 200 milliliters. So it's basically like drinking a third of a bottle of whiskey each bottle. So Oh, wow. Sign me up. <laughs> put, case of saldo, I was case like, of those, yeah, and, I was like, yeah, put put some of those in a to go uh, for a care package for us. I'm all I'm all about some RTDs right now, man. They're they're fantastic. They're on your way. So Jordan, I'm uh, I'm down in in Oakland. I don't know if um, if Andrew told you. So at some point, I'm gonna I'm gonna come up and see y'all. Sweet. Yeah. All right. That's not all right. So far. so just to let everybody know, we have got. The Cabernet, the Grenache, and the Zinfandel. Um, Where are we starting, gentlemen? I guess alphabetical. alphabetical. Alphabetical is the easiest way to figure this out. Do okay. Uncle Shim puts us uh, puts us in the right direction over here. Uncle Shim, do you do you hate that Shim? No, I'm I'm the one that invoked it. So <laughs> okay. I'm like, help your Uncle Shim out with some tasting notes on that. Uh, <laughs> Fair enough. That barrel it. selection. Uh, so I get this, and yeah, there's another question for you here, Jordan. Yeah, no, uh, Lucas. The, the the base whiskeys are from the uh, the same lot. Um, well, I say that I'm not I'm not going to uh, exaggerate that they're about eight months younger um, for what I sent these guys for the cab Grenachians in because that's what we're working through currently. Uh, they're from some 16 2016 yeah. base. What the what the gentleman just selected in this uh, 2126 barrel is from the last of our 2015 stock. Uh, but mash bills are the same, Dis distillation process is the same, aging characteristics or, or you know, aging uh, kinetics are the same, same uh, temperature area. Anyway, all that. So it's as close as we can get. Um, but uh, with the varietal finishes, they shouldn't be too much different. Really, what the, the, the wine barrels add, they're very surface note their top notes you're not going to make you know that's why you can't take a a two-year-old whiskey that's you know marginally okay something you've made try to try to mask it under a bunch of wine finish it's uh you're not going to make anything good um what you uh the only thing you can do with finishing barrels is try to elevate something that's already very good and look to uh, uh giving it an extra dimension um not that makes it palatable or something worth selling. If it's if it's shit to begin with, it's going to be shit when you're done with it. It's garbage in, garbage out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It's got to be good. You put it in. You make it better, and you know you determine whether you uh, did the wrong thing afterward. And said, "Damn, this is better before." And I these did. these barrels. Um, did did you say they they were coming in from from Europe or were they uh, California? Only the Grenache barrel comes in from Europe. Comes in okay. from France. Rhone. Yes. We come from France. I love Grenache. <laughs> Grenache is so good. Yeah. I guess I'm I'm so I I guess I've got to be the most basic one here because you all are talking like Grenache. I have no idea. Like when <laughs> Chateau, Chateau Neuf de Pop. The the rare times that I order a wine at dinner, it's usually a cab. That's that's typically what it is because I don't know any different uh, or any better, should I say? And, and I just know I like I like red, but I like deep kind of like earthy red. Yeah, that's, well, that's yeah, this, this, this whole program here, guys. I mean, uh, I've I've been around this industry again, you know, for 15 years, a lot, a lot less than some of my contemporaries. Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm no Jim Rutledge or Jeff Arnett or uh, any of those boys. They, 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 uh, they know their industries better than I ever probably will. But what I know is uh, also the wine industry that I, I came up in originally, and. Um, I haven't found a lot of people experimenting out in uh, really, you know, things like like what you just said there, Shem. You know, uh, like a lot of people don't know what the hell a Grenache is, especially a Southern Rhone Grenache, like, uh, you know, uh, doing where the hell more eats and, and whatnot. So um, this nose is incredible. It's crazy, Grenache. right? Like, yeah, and, and the cab is, is lovely, too. The cab was good. The Grenache on the nose. I'm just going nose is only next level. Yeah, it's next level. I'm still on the cab. Are you onto the Grenache? <laughs> I just I'm <laughs> nosing them. But Jordan, like with the wine, like Kenny walking in through wines, like a Cabernet. Yes, is gonna have that earthy kind of 
a little bit of tannicky, drier type wine. A Zinfandel is going to be more jammy, like sugary, brown, you know, dark sugars, fruit. A little spicier, too. A little spicier, yeah. And then uh, Grenache is kind of somewhat on that. I'm, I'm trying to, what would you describe a Grenache? Well, you know, it's it's a bit of, it's got the, it's got the, uh, kind of dense stewed fruited Zinfandel, kind of a more jammy like preserve or, uh, you know, uh, kind of a preserve or compote note to it. Uh, but it, it's so floral. Grenache has yeah. these floral qualities to it that bring in, you know, uh, spring meadow flowers and uh, uh, just this bouquet of uh, a little bit of lily and lilac, like some really intense floral notes. Um, yeah. But totally. yeah. And, and right on with the cap. Uh, it's uh, it's what you'd expect from from Cabernet. A fresher red fruit, cherry, mainly cherry. Big cherry, big raspberry, a little bit of blackberry. You know, if you really want to stretch out there along that spectrum of, of something fresh, fruity, before it becomes, you know, cooked and into jam note like Zinfandel. So. I kind of think of, uh, of like a berry crisp. You know, yeah, yeah that works because it's yeah, got all uh, the cinnamon and the and the uh, you know vanilla notes in there too. Jordan, you mentioned something earlier, uh, you know, about like garbage in, garbage out, and whatnot. You know, it's it's funny because we see this all the time that people talk about it in the whiskey world, and it's most of the time it's it's people that just try to cause a storm on Facebook and different kind of forums, and they try to say that. Oh, you take a you take a shitty whiskey and you finish it to try to cover up hide the shitty whiskey. Yeah. yeah, to try to hide either the youth notes or or anything out of it. But you you kind of took a, a different approach to that. Kind of kind of talk about your your thought process there. Yeah, uh, well, you know, like I said, I don't think you're going to take anything that's not drinking well uh, as you pull it out of its primary aging vessel, which uh, you know we all agree for American whiskeys, bourbon rye whiskey, uh, you know, not that rye whiskey's uh, uh, primarily American, but I'm talking about American style rye whiskeys. Bourbon specifically, you're not going to take it out of its, uh, uh, you know, charred American oak barrels, put it into something else and and cheat the uh, cheat, cheat history there and make it make it way better than they could have done if they just left it in the, uh, you know, 200 liter vessel for the appropriate amount of time. So, I mean, it is interesting. They talk about the same sorts of constructs in cooking. You know, if you're if you're going to be adding a spirit or a wine, you always have to start with a good one. Otherwise, it's it's going to your finished food product is going to have the same issues. Yeah, exactly. If you wouldn't drink it, don't put it in anything you're going to eat. Exactly. <laughs> and uh, in the wine industry. Uh, you know, finishing barrels or, or just barrel aging regimens uh, all together are referred to as elevage. And, and it's, a, it's a, you know, French term for elevating what's already there. You've, uh, you've made something, hopefully it's quality that you've made, the wine in, in, the, in the term of that, uh, that particular uh, nomenclature. Uh, excuse me. It's okay. We all have, we all have those. <laughs> Can you still see me? These are all three. Yeah, we can still see you. You're good. I can't see well, you, but we'll keep on. Oh, you, uh, you can't see us? We can see you. So if you're if you're worried about it, we can still see you. That works. Uh, no, it's uh, with that uh, um, idea of elevating what you've already done. You know, you're not going to make anything uh, uh, better. It wasn't. You're not going to make anything better than what it was. Well, you might make something better than what it was when it went in, but you're not going to correct any flaws that were there when it went in. Gotcha. Jordan, are you on a Mac uh, on that side? I am. <laughs> um, I think your phone, when it when it rang, took over. If you go back to the Chrome uh, browser, you'll probably find us again. I'm on his Mac. Uh, yeah. <laughs> hey, guys. Uh, hey. He's back. Can you not see him? Uh, we can we see can him, see but him. he can't see us. We can see him. I got him back. Hey. Okay, cool. Turn your phone off. Don't take any calls, Andy. Yeah. <laughs> it's just silence. It's, it's, it's on. I don't know how I don't, don't want to hear about it. At least you're quick on the tech support. Like he was there. <laughs> Heck yeah. Right on. Well, uh, are you guys on to the Zen? 
I'm oh, pass, yeah. I'm passes in. I'm making my third and fourth know, pass in some of these. It's, back to revisit them all. They're all so good. You guys have been obviously working together for a long time. Uh, you don't need my input on, on what you want. There's no wrong way to put these together. I think you made a solid choice on 2126. Whether you put it in a cap, Grenache, or Zinf Zinfandel barrel is entirely your choice. Uh, I would love to say I could uh, split it up between a couple for you, but that's, that's going to be ass. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, we're not going to be like picky. Yeah. Don't don't you worry about that. Can you However, or good question. Little, you you all sent us a 50 ml uh, tubes. I didn't know what these were for, though. Ah, uh, you know, just in case, like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> we, we had supply. We had to get rid of them. Like, <laughs> I think it was in, in the event that we wanted to blend some of the, the finished with the unfinished. That's but the I, idea there. I, I mean, I, I think, I think it kind of stands for itself. We can kind of get the idea of where the finishing will take us and start with the right base that we love and go from there. Well, I'm interested to see how this goes. I mean, you guys want to confer amongst yourselves, or are you, are you ready to vote? I think we need just like maybe maybe two minutes. Yes, Ryan, of course. Ryan, one or two minutes, something like that. Yeah, I've like I said, I mean, I've, I, I'm pretty sure I know what I want. But. I will say by far that this is this is a crazy awesome opportunity to be able to like choose a bourbon and choose a wine Which cask is. to finish it in. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know of anybody else that offers a, a program like this, and so it's it's really unique and really cool. I mean, I know I know Angels Envy has the opportunity to do it, but I don't think you get to. You, actually, I know you don't get to choose you, you this get this level of variability, right? Like and they're you, they're not doing wine, really cool. right? They're they're doing like desserts, uh, spirits, right? Right. Yeah, they're, it's port. It's port finished. That yeah. is their that is their thing. But I mean, this is this is a, a real cool thing. I mean, you have uh, multiple levels of you know customization that we get to have for ourselves. So really a cool opportunity. This is the, uh, you know, this is the direction I've gone with, with all this. I think uh, without innovation, we're just doing the same thing over and over. So I like to. You call it innovation. Some people on the other side of you might call it a pain in the ass. It's, it's just, <laughs> you know, it's. <laughs> yeah. Everybody in the barrel house calls it a pain in the ass. <laughs> exactly. That's what I figured. So you're telling us we gotta go get that barrel out of the mid tier and roll it and dump it into this barrel <laughs> and roll it back in. And then I gotta come back 45 days later and make sure it didn't turn to shit. All right, sounds this sounds this sounds like a real scalable solution here, Jordan. <laughs> lab and don't don't miss the dates. You know what? My guys are very good. Like I said, uh, uh, well, I don't know if I said this to you. My uh, my my one of my first mentors said the difference between science and fucking around is writing everything down and we write <laughs> that's a, i love that i'm gonna use that line God, I, we should put that on a t-shirt that's i was gonna say that should be a t-shirt so you know what we taste things we write it down we come back we revisit we write down the notes there we just keep coming back to it and uh that's a good way to just make something delicious that's awesome there's certain quotes you hear in your life and they stick that one stuck i'm gonna yeah <laughs> So, uh, Jordan, I'll give, I'll give you one more. So all the time that you go back and you try something and it's never been good. Give us an example. Uh, when something's gone past its, uh, past its point where I would. Well, just, just the, the science, you know, being a science of being able to write something down and come back and, you know, revisiting it. Give us oh, an example awesome. of something that just went bad. You know that that statement, as as I just made, uh, you know, interpreted as you just did. Very rarely do you uh, uh, do something, write it down, come back and say, "Well, that was bad, and I, I shouldn't have written it down." More to the point, uh, I've had many a night standing around in a lab at, at Distillery X or Distillery Y with talented distiller X, Y, and Z coming up with some amazing ideas, samples in front of us. Uh, putting together blends, drinking, but not writing any of the shit down that we're doing. And then the next day when we end up with our little sample bottles, like, wow, that is amazing. What do we do there, guys? And nobody has notes on it. Groundhog Day. There have been, I have literally, mainly in like really obscure things like uh, like trying to develop new uh, Amari or uh, liqueurs, uh, things that are, you know, complicated to come up with something and you have a little epiphany 
in a moment and you put it together, but you get so excited, taste it like, that's it, that's it. And then you don't write it down. The next day, when you all wake up in the, on the, in the couches in the tasting room. Uh, <laughs> so, so that's a real thing then, huh? It's a real thing. They, call, they do call it all-nighters for a reason. Yeah. <laughs> there have been uh, there's some amazing products the world will never be able to taste because a whole bunch of us distillers uh, passed out before we wrote it down. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. All right. I definitely have my finish. Okay. Yeah. Me too. Me three. Hopefully, it's I don't know if I should vote. Yeah, Jordan, hold your vote. We'll, we'll we'll let uh we'll let us go first. Maybe you have to be a tiebreaker or something. Okay. Even okay. though we got three votes here, so we'll see. All right. Should we should we go down the line? Should you want to do top two again, or no? I say just top one. Cup. Okay. I think uh, at least for three. me, at least you say top three. <laughs> top three. That's probably yeah. the best way to do it. <laughs> All right. So if Cab was your first, raise your hand. All right. I have it's a feeling. A second, this, though. I have a feeling this is going. Grenache. Ah, I figured as much. We're all there right there. Yep. We don't, all right. So we don't need to go to the Zen. But I was torn between Zen and Grenache, but Grenache just like it elevated God, everything. So much fruit. Oh, it's yeah. so good. It's I was, really good. I was I was almost Jordan. about to put in the chat and say like y'all this Grenache is so good but I didn't want to like give up my vote and and yeah. spill it too early. Jordan's probably like that's the wrong. I, I hate to say it guys but Grenache was the poison. Ah. <laughs> 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 we should have picked Zin. Ah, no, that's beautiful. It's funny when when Andrew and I were were talking about kind of setting this up in the first place he was talking about the Grenache finish being kind of his favorite as well. And I was like, I can't wait to try it because it was among my my favorite wines to drink as well. I mean, I think there's there's such like a good fruit balance on it that yeah. it is so elevated and, and it's so it's so unique. And I can't wait to see what the barrel that we picked and see what happens, kind of like a little bit of that spice characteristic and kind of see what happens to it. I think it'll yep. be fun. It, this will be this will be an awesome barrel. So I'm super yeah, excited for it. Because the distillate we picked had a lot of, like we were talking about, citrus, aromatics, like fruit, a little bit of fruitiness, and then you add the Grenache on it. I feel like it's just going to elevate it even more. I'm I'm excited. I think the distillate we picked could stand on its own as as a single barrel, and it's just getting get better with this yeah. Grenache finish. Yeah. Absolutely, gentlemen. And uh, two six here. You know, you guys picked it for its aromatic complexity. It's it's obvious, like superiority over the others as far as uh, what it brought to, to up front, mid palate, and then you know, not crushing that under the more aggressive Cabernet Zin barrels, picking the more subtle barrel of the Grenache uh, that has been used the most in the wine process. You know, these are four and fifth use. Uh, that's why I love them for the rye because rye is so spicy and aggressive. I, I bring it back. I love it for bourbon too. I would have used it if I didn't uh, choose the cap because you know, sometimes I just make choices based on other things. Plus you gotta make it different. You gotta make it unique. You just can't use the same damn thing for everything. Exactly, exactly. No, I think that's a that's a fantastic choice, gentlemen. Honestly, it's, it's, uh, I, do, I do these uh, yeah, pretty well always on a podcast, but uh, that is a solid choice. Are are the rides uh, that you guys uh, are doing? Um, oh, go ahead, Lauren. Sorry. Oh no no sorry I interrupted. Go ahead. I, I was just going to say, are, are the rides that uh, that you're you're um, finishing, are they also um, MGP or are they your yeah. own distillate? They're they're most. I mean, uh, I I was able to contract a small amount through uh, uh, Tennessee Deceptive through uh, Dickel. In Tennessee, it's uh, actually oh, very great. And their ride is fantastic. It is amazing that people have slept on a lot of their stuff because it is not the same as the bourbon. Not even close. Interesting. I've not had it. We have the same recipe. Uh, we're using the same recipe as Rittenhouse, um, mm -hmm. which I know is from Head and Hill. Uh, but Rittenhouse, uh, same. We, we requested the same recipe from. Uh, uh, Tickle, who made it for us. It's a small lot. It's 51% rye. It's 45% uh, uh, corn and 4% malted barley. So 
we uh, we took the the minimum amount of rye, and that's because we wanted. We I knew I was going to paint over this with uh, uh, with a lot of wine barrel finish. I didn't want to try to take something like bullet, you know, or you know, a typical ninety five percent recipe, and try to paint wine finishes mm. for that. It was going to get really awkward. I needed I needed corn. I needed neutral palate, uh, and I needed to make a bourbon maker's rye. So. That's what Real we did, cool. and that's what we're mirroring here. Our our daily formula is fifty one. Our daily mash bill is fifty one percent rye, and we're only we're putting it on a three year aging regimen. I'm not trying to make this a four or five year old super complex, and we're going to always finish it in the Grenache barrels, and we'll have our first in house uh, rye uh, out next year. So, we'll also awesome. try some rye samples at some point. Yeah. So you all heard it here first. So we've got barrel number 2126. I'm probably not going to be able to get this to focus on the camera, but just know that it is a, Jordan, when we say six year, 21% rye MGP. Five year. Five year. Five year. Well, I don't know. Count, count forward for 2015. You're right. I, I'm super it's bad at math. I guess I'm super bad at math. So it was, it was barrel in, uh, or entry date of, um, November 12th, 2015. So, so in November, it'll be six. Yeah. November to be six. I would hope that at this point, we'll probably well, start the process days. before then. So We're it'll probably still be five. For November. So it's five and some change. It's you uh, that tonight. <laughs> yeah, tonight. I was like, they're already there. Might as well just go start you're on, it. You're on Pacific Coast time. Hell, it's only, <laughs> it's only six. Yeah. You don't need to go like eat. Just after seven. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's about dinner time for you all. And then uh, finishing it in a Grenache barrel, which we all, it, this is honestly, and Ryan knows this better than any of this. Like when we, when he and him pick barrels, we're usually like on opposite sides. This is one of the very few times that we have all chosen the same barrel twice in one evening, not only just for the, the whiskey, but then for the finish. So I've never, I've never seen it happen. And and I rewatched I the videos either. in order to make the tasting notes for the Shopify. So <laughs> usually Kenny has to convince me on a barrel, and I have to convince him. So it's, yep. <laughs> it's averaging cook distillery, bringing people together. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, perfect. It's now fantastic. We just need to go to Napa, and hang out. Yeah, we go to Morimoto, get some dinner. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, like, come on up, see me. I'd love to show you around the distillery. Uh, and. Yeah, Morimoto, you're buying, Kenny. <laughs> you know what? Shim's Uncle Shim's buying. He's older. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I'll, I'll <pick> <laughs> He's uh, our uncle. Be before we sign off, though, uh, there is one question from Brian Clark. It says, because he wants to go and try to find one of your kind of like shelf or flagship items. So, like, what's what would that be? Brian, I would definitely say the burning chair. If you, uh, if, if you can find the burning chair at your local uh, uh, liquor store, that's our bourbon whiskey. My rye is the lip service. Absolutely. We give them all these proprietary names uh, because, again, it's, you know, Dave Finney trying to differentiate himself. You see there's not a lot of uh, explanation of what the actual whiskey is on the front label. So, uh, but, hey, I'm excited about making rye whiskey. That's the thing that uh, I think is going to be our future. But right now the bourbon whiskey is our big seller. Uh, we do them both with passion and the best we can. I hope you enjoy them both. Cool. We did. I, I know. I've, I know. I've seen the lip service because it's it's that image of somebody like holding down their lips and having a tattoo across it's it. Like, and so, yeah. And so, I think that should probably we should probably have Ryan get a tattoo in his lip just to kind of commemorate <laughs> this. Well, you, down with that? you do it. <laughs> you go first. Well, hold on. Like it was my idea. You, you have to remember. Remember. You're the idea person. I'm the executor, so I'm executing on on the idea that you already I didn't come up with that idea. Well, no, like you you had you had implanted it in me already, and so oh, it okay. basically just came full circle. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> it's all right. There's there's no tattoos that are gonna happen tonight. Come on out and do it here at the distillery if you're gonna do it. I got a great tattoo artist. We'll get them right here in the center of the <laughs> Make it a bit. Right on. We might have to charge for people to come to that one. <laughs> Ouch. 
I know. But hey, it was fun tonight. Thank you so much. Jordan, stay on. Everybody stay on uh, before I end this stream. But I want to say thank you, everybody that joined us tonight. If you're curious where you can get uh, any of the barrel selections that we do choose, you can go and check it out, bourbonpursuit.com. And then there is a link at the top that says Private Barrel Club. It tells you all the information that you need to know on what we do. We select over 40 barrels every single year. And it gives you information on do we what's the cost how do we ship how where does everything go through so it gives you all that information so you don't have to worry about it and these will come out here in the next few months um but we've always got a lot of good things kind of cooking up today we just released four episodes of pursuit series so excited to be able to release that there were two finger lakes and two woodenville barrels that we had private labeled that we put our, put underneath our own label so we have that going on we've got Let's see, Shem, we have going on. We've Whistle got the, pig is coming up. Those um, are the 16 and 17 year barrels yeah. that we selected last December that yeah. are going to be coming up very, very soon. Three, three barrels, two sizes. We yep, uh, yeah, because we're going to do 375 mLs in a package, so mm -hmm. you don't have to sit there and you know drop every everything on the 750s, but so. Three seven, sorry, three three seventy fives. Mm -hmm. Let's see. We got the email today that the old Forester barrel proof is kind of. It's we got a few more weeks on it, but it's coming in. Yellowstone is in. Old Elk is in. So we'll probably sequence things either Old Elk first with Yellowstone and then Whistlepig, um, and then Old Foe. That's that's Same. probably the order that we'll go in. A lot of good barrels coming, and this is this is just the releasing part. We're still selecting. We're doing this every few weeks, so just make sure you keep tuning in. But again, thank you everybody that was a part of this. I think we had like thirty five people on at one point, but I appreciate everybody trying to take taking this some time out of their evening tonight. And now you get to wait for a a, a custom Savage Cook barrel that'll come out here in the next few months. But cheers, everybody, and we'll see you here. I guess in the next barrel pick. Next, next right week. Good drinking with you, gentlemen.